ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. Welcome to the Only One Mike Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gerard. Today, I'm joined by journalist, documentarian, producer, and filmmaker, Carlos P. Beltran. How you doing, Carlos? Doing well. Thanks, man. All right. Glad that you was able to join us today. Carlos is an award-winning documentarian, and his work focuses on a wide range of issues from civil rights to human interest stories in Latin America and the U.S. He's been featured in many of the leading news outlets. What are some of the outlets that you're featured in, Carlos? Yeah, well, I run the gamut. Um, and NBC News, ABC News, uh, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, Latin outlets like uh, Univision and Telemundo as well. Yeah. All right. You Took time to talk to us, man. I appreciate that because <laughs> you're a busy dude, man. Busy dude. Now, um, I was going over some of your work. Very interesting stuff. So you're originally from Caracas, Venezuela. Is that correct? That is right. Yeah. Oh, born and raised. Born it. and raised. All right. Now you're in my hometown of Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. how you like it so far? I love it. I've been uh, moved over here, transplanted to uh, Brooklyn uh, in 2015. So it's been what six years going on seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you was you came in right around the time to change, you know. So you quite had a good time for <laughs> real. <laughs> what was it like growing up in Caracas? It's a 4.5 million people city. Caracas now is known, people who know it, as a kind of a controversial. A uh, very uh, dystopian sort of kind of contrasty city, uh, you know, the gap between those who have and have not is quite uh, broad and you have, uh, you know, political turmoil, hyperinflation, you know, so it's uh, it wasn't an easy city, but uh, I was born and raised until I was 16 uh, mm -hmm. years old. And then I was lucky that um, I was able to finish up high school in the U.S., uh, for an exchange program. I wasn't planning on it, but it just happened. And mm. then my life just kind of derailed into, you know, uh, in a good way into the U.S., ha giving me that opportunity to have the background of having, you know, been born and raised in Latin America, but also being in the Midwest, uh, you know, Kansas and getting to know the U.S. from its very much insights. And uh, the rest is history. I've been pretty much everywhere in the U.S. and many places in Latin America as well as a journalist. And yeah, you know, for personal reasons as well. And uh, when did where did you attend college at? You attended college in Kansas, or was it yes, else? yes. I got a small scholarship from the University of Kansas. Uh, their journalism program is actually outstanding. Uh, not a whole lot of people think about Kansas as a for one reason or another as a as a as a state with uh, with uh, you know journalism and media, you know. Uh, school but it actually helped quite a lot and i loved it and uh because of my education in kansas i got uh, opportunities up on the west coast and eventually in the east coast but uh, yeah university of kansas i uh, graduated in 2009 okay what attracted you to journalism about to me is about storytelling of course it's a broad question because you can talk about uh you know the ethics and morals and and then the responsibility that we have as journalists to tell stories the unbiased way around it but i've always seen myself as a storyteller uh storyteller first and foremost um and i ended up in journalism because i always wanted to do creative things, right? I actually went, uh, I have a uh, background in advertising as well. So oh. storytelling has always been a very in, like intrinsic part of my life uh, as a professional and on a personal level. And uh, suddenly I understood that, you know, when it comes to journalism, as long as you have a camera, a microphone and a subject, then you could tell a story, um, you know, if you knew how to go about it, you know? And, um, and that's, that, that was the spark. That was the spark for it. And, uh, I'm lucky that today I uh, get to make a living off of uh, telling stories. Some stories I'm very passionate about. Some stories just need to be told uh, because it's, you know they're in the news cycle. Right. Um, but uh, it's storytelling nonetheless. So, yeah. yeah, I was. I just had an interview last night, and I was telling the um, young lady that I interviewed, and I said the same thing: is that there's stories out here that need to be told. Like it's just. Like people like yourself, like a lot of people don't know what happens behind the scenes in journalism mm -hmm. because we only look at the major networks and see what goes on when they're sitting behind a the desk with a the teleprompter. Mm -hmm. But 
your work have you right on like the front line. Some of the stuff that you've done, I know you've covered the uh, protests of Ni- Nicolas Maduro in uh, mm-hmm. Venezuela, which was, you know, very violent protests. And you were right like in the thick of it. So you've seen everything boots on the ground. And you also sat down with like a lot of hardcore drug dealers. They were doing their thing. How do you get people to sit down with you and be comfortable enough to do this in front of you? You know, like, because normally <laughs> there was a code, like when you were doing these things that you didn't put this out there for public consumption because it was too indicting. How do you get people to be comfortable enough to do this? You know, to sit down, like, how do you even make the approach? So uh, in the most general sense, I don't believe in being able to tell compelling stories through parachute journalism. You know, you can't just pop up somewhere and one day or two get your story and get the hell out. Uh, You get uh, only the gist of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You need to be able to have your foundation. And I did cover Venezuela for four to five years. Uh, And the stories that you mentioned, me being able to do stories on cocaine traffickers in the slums of Venezuela or Mm -hmm. uh, cover very in in a very in-depth way, the riots and political turmoil over there come from me having made contacts uh, with uh, with, uh, many, call them subjects or characters in the, in the, I get side guy stuff, uh, Venezuelan right. pop culture and, and the streets, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for example, you mentioned the cocaine traffickers. That's right. just because uh, I always I maybe approach because I knew that I wanted to tell uh, I had, you know, brush with with uh, that world because mm-hmm. of the many stories that I had told over the years. But my freelancer, I guess the person who took me from one place to the other, he he had contacts, he had mm-hmm. friends, uh, you know. He introduced me. I spent about a week or two just making, you know, acquaintances, if not not friends. That's too much of a, of a word. If I'm a journalist, I'm just making acquaintances with these folks. And in the end, their ego pushed them to say, I don't care. Put a camera on me and I'll tell you whatever it is you want to, you know, want to hear. And yeah. And then that's 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 how I did it. Um, yeah, in that specific instance, but it's a case by case basis. My only uh, general rule is don't try to or even pretend that you're going to be able to tell a full on in depth story uh, in just uh, one or two days. You know, popping up somewhere without contacts or you know prep work. You know, right. So in those mm-hmm. situations, like I know you you've dealt with various situations and people like understand that he's not just doing you know, violence and crime. Like there's a lot of good human interest stories. Go to Carlos P. Beltran.com. Look at some of his videos. A lot of it is not violence. It's a lot of good human interest stuff out there. Um, Mm -hmm. What is the most interesting situation you've been in while covering a story? Like, you know, these are dangerous (laughs) situations in most cases. Do you put yourself in a situation where you're thinking like, what did I get into? Like, what, where is this going? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, let me just touch on that point. Yeah, I've covered everything from uh, you know political turmoil in, in in South America to trends uh, in in the U.S. Uh, so I literally have done pieces on what ASMR means or what the meaning of death is over here. <laughs> I mean, just name the name or or what the death positivity movement is, or mm. um, you know, uh, so a little bit of everything. Uh, to answer your question, yeah, sometimes, you know, especially when I'm 35 right now, when mm-hmm. we're younger storytellers, I'm sure that I made very foolish decisions. Uh, you know, just uh, I felt like I had no responsibility other than you know, tell my story. And I didn't really, you know, I, I made very rash decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, luckily, I'm lucky to be able to say today that it's all been for the better. But uh, you always have to you know, be conscious of the decision that you're, 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 you're taking, um, the repercussions. In 2016, I was telling a story along with ABC News. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were, again, once again, we were, uh, I've, already, I've already been based in New York, but I traveled to Venezuela to tell a story on uh, government-run hospitals and hyperinflation and uh, the medical, you know, uh, medicine shortage in the country. Right. And a correspondent and I were caught filming instead of a government-run uh, hospital. And, uh, you know, obviously it's a story that is not favorable to the government. The government is not, uh, does not seem with keen eyes, mm-hmm. you know, foreign journalism. Uh, so I spent five days inside a political prison 
in Venezuela, not knowing that I was going to spend five days over there. At that point, wow. you you think the worst. I was I was Venezuelan. I am Venezuelan, so you know I thought that I might be you know made a I would have been made a, a, a what do you call it uh, an example of right. Uh, but uh, so those were extremely five, very, very long five days. Uh, and fortunately, you know, after, you know, what probably sounds like a, you know, born identity, you know, movie, <laughs> then we were able to leave the country and, uh, that was that, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I definitely made some decisions that weren't the most, uh, you know, reasonable ones just right. for the sake of telling my story, not, not illegal, not, not not uh immoral and definitely not ethically uh countered you know journalism not at all it just knowing the place knowing the you know the country knowing knowing the laws and knowing the situations i made decisions that ended up in us being you know behind bars for five days but so that that's probably one of my, one of my most uh interesting ones i've been named on national television in south america as well as a trader um, oh, wow. so those are kind of, those are kind of like, uh, you know, appetizers that I throw over there because they sound sensationalistic, but, uh, they do speak of, the, um, you know, the commitment that I've had to my work because I'm still a journalist nowadays. I'm not managing a bar or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or moved on to, uh, and you know, any other realm of storytelling. Yeah. And that's, that's some dangerous stuff, man. So you still labeled a trader there and you still go back. So yeah, I haven't been back to Venezuela since 2017, but, mm. um, uh, yeah, you know, you, you, you have your contacts, you make you as, as if I have to go, you know, you make sure that's as much as you can, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, that there's no problem. But uh, like I said, it's 2021 and haven't been there in what, four years, uh, and it's for a reason. So I'm trying to make more <laughs> sensible uh, choices, uh, you know, these days. Now, what is the story that touched you the most? Um, that's that's difficult because there's been many. There was a story I did back in 2018. I interviewed a uh, spent some time really. Interview is not really the right thing, uh, the right word. Um, a man in Rochester, New York, and he told me about uh, the many many months that he spent with his then girlfriend, who had a very slow and painful death. And so he was making the case for what some people are referred to as assisted suicide, mm. um, which is not the right word. You don't say assisted suicide anymore. I just can't think of the term. But uh, so uh, basically it's 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 illegal in the state of New York to be able to euthanasia. I euthanasia, guess, yeah. Illegal. yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, illegal in the state of New York. So I interviewed a few people over here. First, that man who told me about his his girlfriend and then an older woman who was very ill who wanted to so that's that puts you in a, in a space where you know you're trusted with a camera and i spend uh you know a couple of days with a woman who uh who basically wanted to uh pass you know mm -hmm. uh but it was not legal for her to uh to do it in new york to have anybody help her pass in new york and she didn't have the word with all to move to a state that would allow her to right. go through the process so uh, of course here i'm breaking that rule that i have of not just jumping into a story being able to tell that because i did spend a couple of days with each of these people but i did a lot of prep work mm -hmm. so a lot of phone calls before i showed up over there but at any rate that's one of the stories that if you ask me pops up you know right away but i've done i've done stories on family separations in the u.s and in political asylum seekers in the u.s that also you know are quite uh, emotional and emotionally yeah. draining as well yeah, I understand. Now, for the young journalists that's out there, you know, um, how do you actually come up with the stories? Because you're in New York right now, and there's no shortage of stories in New York at all. So <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be surprised. You'd, you'd be surprised. <laughs> really? In, in, in New York. Yeah. In New York, there are stories, but a lot of people are fishing for the same. So it's like mm -hmm. being in a pond filled with fish that everybody else is fishing. Uh, so if you're a slightly late Mm -hmm. then somebody has already stole that story, you know? Okay. So a lot of people, ask, yeah, a lot of people ask me, so in New York, I mean, you probably have a story to tell every single day. Somebody else is telling that story. You mm -hmm. have to move quick. You have, you still have to have an in. Doesn't matter if you're in Iowa or you're in New York or you're in Caracas, you still need to have, move into certain circles, have your, you know, freelancers who help you around or have, right. you know, have a bit of a network 
So when a story comes up that it's in your beat or in your interest, someone helps you to get there to that story uh, normally. So, uh, and I didn't let you finish uh, your question. No, sorry, no, 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 I, you're good. I, I didn't want to make it. Because <laughs> I was wondering yeah. if you were going to answer it within that, because sometimes that happens, man. So like, how do you find these stories? Do you, like, I know you say you have your contacts and all, um, like, as a journalist, like, how do you actually sniff out these stories? Like, how do you know? you know, which one is the one and how do you actually approach whatever news outlet you're working with at that time to say, this is the mm-hmm. story that I want you guys to back my play on. How would you do that for the journalist that's out there? It's all, it's all about pitching a story. I think that now uh, there are, you know, 10 years ago, it's more difficult for just uh, you know, a new graduate, new journalist to just say, Hey, I'm going to pick up a camera and I'm going to pitch a story to, you know, national geographic and say, well, they now there's many outlets that or networks that connect you directly with the network. And nowadays, because there's, you know, let's just be honest, there's the, the, the market of uh, nonfiction, you know, storytellers mm-hmm. can't can seem to be very saturated, to be quite saturated. So mm-hmm. uh, it's all about your reel. It's all about the stories that you've told. So let me just answer in, in, in two different two different parts. First, you want to get into telling stories if you want to be commissioned by a network to tell your story Mm -hmm. my first advice and this just worked for me it just is not the rule it just worked for me go tell a story that you care about for no money do it on your in your own time something that you really care about and craft something that you're incredibly proud of right then that is your presentation card that's your business card it doesn't matter if you went to columbia university it doesn't matter if you went barclay school it doesn't matter if you went to cal arts it doesn't matter where you went to and that's my belief if you have a reel or a story or a work sample that says i can do this i am a storyteller then that's your door opener um and i can tell you that from experience look at me i mean i don't have a master's degree I have a bachelor's degree in journalism from from the University of Kansas. And I've been lucky enough to travel uh, to more places than I thought that I would precisely because I spent probably four years, three, three years of my life back when it was not that easy or when the gear wasn't that, uh, you know, proficient telling stories of my own and going to film festivals and whatnot. I built my name. Um, nowadays mm-hmm. you can just, you know, grab a camera for 1200 bucks, uh, or less if it's used and then, you know, for, for shooting 4k with a, you know, have a microphone and, uh, spend a month telling a story that you really care about, cut something, you know, two minutes long, five minutes long, different formats. And then that's your presentation cards, much, much easier and faster when I was doing it. So that's in one sense. Uh, and the other is, look, you're not going to pitch, you understand the network. If you're trying to pitch a story to, and by the way, use LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, you can reach out to a lot of people, pay, uh-huh. pay for the LinkedIn professional, and then you get to reach out to the editors of any network right. if you want to pitch them. Or, you know, talk to people that you might know from your networks. Uh, if you know me, you can pitch directly to NBC at this particular point in time. You know? uh-huh. um, but um, my, my advice would be, like, know the network. If you're going to pitch the New York Post, for example, uh-huh. it's not the same as if you were to pitch to the New York Times. Physical media and print. Like right. the pitches would be completely different. Is what is that what you're saying? Correct me if I'm wrong. It, well, well, in, in a sense, uh, when it comes to story, you know, you're talking about a difference of maybe format or a difference in logistics. But the story is the story, whether it's in print or video. However, the New York Post uh, releases or publishes stories that are different from those released by the New York Times. They also have different standards. Right. Uh, same with same with any other network. So you're not gonna pitch a story about, probably a story about tax evasion to National Geographic, because it makes no sense. Makes National no sense. Geographic's not gonna take up that story, right? right? So the New York Post likes more, you know, upbeat, more character profile, kind of gritty, you know, sex appeal type of stories. Um, Almost you know, tabloid like. To be honest with yeah, you, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, you know that kind of thing. And by the way, I'm very good friends with the folks at the in the video department of the New York Post. I've done plenty of work for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the 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 cocaine traffickers in Venezuela story, I did that for the New York Post. They allowed me to tell that story, but it was gritty. It was real. You right. know, it's different than if you were to pitch, say, to 
ABC News under a different standard. Maybe ABC News would have told you, oh, look, you know, if these people are doing cocaine in front of you. Maybe that's, that's something that we cannot air, you know? Right. So and that's just an example. So that's that's just for you to really know who you're pitching this story. Otherwise, you're just throwing, you know, darts in the dark. With the mediums, too, that we, that we all use these days, everybody's pretty much becoming a journalist at this point. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that, but it's also it's also different. And I think that at some point, very soon, we're going to make the distinction between a journalist uh, and a doc- documentarian, or you know, just mm-hmm. a storyteller. Right. Um, you know, and I guess this is very timely. I'm not sure when you'll publish this, but the Anthony Bourdain documentary uh, mm-hmm. dropped, I guess, a week or two ago. Right. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about wh- how the director made choices that are not strictly uh journalistic but they're more stylistic in in the storytelling world for example they used ai artificial intelligence to mimic the voice of anthony bourdain yeah i heard about reading through some text right so that is something that in journalism and for any network that you're working for you will never be able to do Mm-hmm. However, this is a documentary. This is storytelling. And documentaries, for the most part, are the vision of the filmmaker, of the director. So you have some flexibility. So when you talk about nowadays everybody's a journalist, I would say nowadays everyone has the capability. It's more feasible. Not everybody, but most people have the feasibility of becoming a storyteller mm-hmm. because you can have a camera, a microphone, a subject. And if you know how to edit, then you can tell these stories in a very appealing, stylistic way. Mm-hmm. Is that journalism? Well, it just it just it depends. And I'm hoping that at no point we're going to we're going to run into the question of what is journalism versus what is art versus what is documentary, because it can get very ambiguous and blurred. But right. uh, so that's my, my that, those, that's my two cents on <laughs> on, you know, on the, on the whole. Everybody's a journalist. I believe everybody can be a storyteller. Right. Journalism holds standards of ethics and legalities that, you know, uh, documentarians don't have to uphold themselves to strictly speaking. Yeah. So like a certain specials, you can't air, like you said, on ABC where someone's doing drugs or someone's on drugs or something like that. Whereas, you know, the regular person puts that on YouTube, they just put it out on YouTube. So, yeah. And also right. like the network right. standards, right? We're talking about as well. Not just the like ABC News itself standards, but it's also network standards, if I'm correct, that it's just certain things you can't show with certain times. And even though TV is like everything, anything goes these days, but, you know, I understand what you're saying, because that's not an actual story with characters. Those are actual people and you have to be sensitive to that subject. Of course. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's and there's and there's so many differences. Like people would, would ask you, well, what do you want to tell? Oh, I'm sorry, I have a I have a. This is New York. This is New York, man. Sirens. Yeah. Yeah. I go to yeah. sleep to those noises. <laughs> so I understand. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, but no, look, when you talk about, and, and you can also get into the whole topic of what's, what's shareable, what's popular, you know, like if, uh, yeah, how many views can I get for this story on, you know, something that's super interesting, but, uh, but look, you know, look at TikTok. Look at uh, well, Snapchat seems like uh, you know almost obsolete now. But look at right. TikTok. Like anything over there can be popular, made me made, made popular and has millions of views. It has nothing to do with journalism or even storytelling. It's just it's just something. It's a character. It's something that's happening that becomes popular. So I am of the thought that successful journalism has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with views. It doesn't matter if five people watched a video that you made or, well, I mean, I guess if three million people have watched it, but views should not be the standard of quality journalism. I've seen plenty of incredible journalism pieces out there that only get a you know handful, just dozens or maybe you know a thousand or two views. Um, as opposed to something that is, you know, has nothing to do with journalism, but it's, you know, catchier or it's an explainer or it's just just more more more, uh, you know, visually uh, sparkling, if you know what I mean, you know, yeah. uh, and that that that's another conversation of its own. It just uh, it, it's always troubled me when we talk about the quality of of a piece in terms of how viral mm-hmm. or not a, a, a video that you make, uh, you know, is. Yeah. Yeah. So do you work directly in the newsrooms or are they just, you know, call you in 
when it's when you have something to present or are you there on a daily basis how does that work at this at this point in time so let me talk for most of my career i worked as a freelancer uh basically i you know traveled to wherever it is that i wanted to travel and i pitched a story from where i was and then you know i pitched to several networks and whoever you know bit then i uh you know I, I i did the story for them now i work for nbc news now as of uh, what is it august 2021 mm. um i work for nbc news exclusively, exclusively. so i am in the, yeah i am in the newsroom i uh, have a beat which is you know climate so all my stories have to be in a way related to that but mm -hmm. So it's a so it's, it's a different world because now I'm inside of the of the beast as you were <laughs> and I am I and went, and you know and I'll I'll, I'll speak very candidly yeah. because a lot of people ask me what the differences between being a freelancer or being staffed you know are and there's many and I've lived many years as a freelancer I have colleagues who have gone from being staffed to freelancers mm -hmm. and I myself went from freelancer to staff so for anyone out there wondering what's better. Uh, there, there's not such answer. It just depends where you are in your life. Uh, I'm in the point in my life where I want to have, I want to be able to have the opportunity to tell stories that I care about with a network that I actually care about. Um, but also the, it gives me some sort of security. The fact that I do have a steady paycheck. Right. Uh, however, as, as a freelancer, I love being able to just travel wherever I wanted and then pitch story where, where you know, where, wherever I was. But then, you know, certain degree of risk comes with that approach because what if, what if nobody buys this story and you already spent the money to be somewhere? You know, so it can get a little, a little tricky. There, there's a certain degree of uh, leverage that you have to have. You know, you give a little to get a little. You know. Yeah. How hectic is a, a day in a newsroom? I know a lot of people probably listening is wondering, like, you know, how is because like today was a pretty interesting news day if you know what i mean with uh, the whole yeah homo situation yeah. so like yeah. how hectic is 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 like an average day yeah your, your average say i mean if you have if you know nothing of, of you know the uh, the newsroom then you think that your average day is like the stock market you right. know a bunch of journalists just screaming and smoking and saying <laughs> you know f you what not you gotta get this story yet that's not how it is uh, at all. And it's because most newsroom nowadays are so um, compartmentalized, you know, like uh, you have different beats. Like I, for example, did not cover uh, the Cuomo stuff because right. I'm climate. So I have nothing to do with that. And my day is so busy that even though I know what's happening with them, I'm not talking to my you know, senior editors or executive directors about that story. Right. So it, it's very busy, but nowadays it's very busy with calls. Like I literally, after this interview with you, I'm going to sit down with my associate producer and talk about this story on farmers in the West Coast and, you know, uh, rising temperatures, uh, you mm -hmm. know. And so we're going to talk about how to craft that story to present it and pitch it to different news shows. Right. right? Like uh, in, at NBC, we have the Today Show, Nightly News, NBC News Now. So internally, we have to pitch to these shows. So I think the whole coming up with ideas and pitching is something that will never end. <laughs> if you're a storyteller, <laughs> you're going to have to pitch stories, come up with them, you know, whether it's just from reading articles to, you know, eavesdropping to whatever. But uh, every everybody's looking for the next big story. And believe me, if you've read it in the New York Times mm -hmm. or in Wall Street Journal, then the story has already been told. Chances are that unless you find a different angle, you're not going to be able to tell that story successfully. No one's going to buy it. So research research and you know trying to find a beat that works for you more research and more research <laughs> you know just for like doing yeah. these podcasts and stuff I, I can yours is like on 20 you know in terms of research you know so i understand mm -hmm. now getting back to the whole thing with you starting in journalism and what attracted you to journalism and all tell us about your first you know your first big break what was it do you remember what story you know, got you in there? And how did you feel when you first saw, like, this is my work that's being displayed right now? So when it comes to my big break in journalism is different than my big break as a storyteller. I remember mm -hmm. that. And just to tell quickly, as a storyteller, I began in advertising. And I remember mm -hmm. that at some point I was directing uh, commercials with 150 extras with the, one of the best uh, directors of cinematography in my country. And, uh, you know, so I felt, and I was only 25, 26 at the time. 
So I felt like I had a huge future in, in that industry. Right. And then I got sick of advertising. My big break in journalism probably was in 2014. I was at the right time at the right place, even though it might have not seemed like it. Uh, right. 2014, I was in Caracas and there were very violent riots in Venezuela uh, for uh, several reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I was one of the few journalists at the time who uh, was producing stories strict, uh, exclusively for U.S.-based networks. And I remember I got a call from Fusion TV. Oh, Fusion. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, Fusion, I don't know if it's a thing anymore, Fusion, but they, right. they reached out and they said, uh, look, we want you to film dispatches for us mm -hmm. uh, every day, just for four or five days, go film and give us dispatches on these stories. And at the time they were paying me something that nobody else had ever paid me, uh, you know, for like in terms of like actual money cash. And I thought, holy crap, okay. <laughs> and I worked extremely hard for five days. I filmed and I edited and delivered, you know, filmed the morning, afternoon, edited and delivered at night. And I made, you know, at the time what I thought it was quite a bit of money. And then that just derailed into me being able to do then stories for uh, AJ Plus and from Univision and then ABC News reached out to me and NBC News and the New York Post. So it was like a domino effect to me, if you understand. Yeah, so, like one thing just was, completely led to another, exactly. was led to another. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I remember I was, it was probably back in 2014, yeah, that I, that I was also doing stories prior to this call, you know, when they asked me to do this patches. Mm -hmm. I remember that I once I got a gig just literally just doing camera for AJ plus. And it was like uh, only like three hours of me just holding my B camera and they paid me like $300 for that. And I took the job. I mean, it was definitely, I, I was more skilled than just that, but I took it because of the badge, because of being able to say, I did something for this network right. and I did it so well. And I gave them such great service that I know that, that I can use them as a reference and that you know, swallowing your ego or saying, look, I know that I can do better things, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get my contacts, you know, on and I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna get references. I'm gonna do that. Even though I'm much more skilled, even though I can do many more things, I'm gonna, I wanna work on my image. And I did that. And again, like you said, it's a domino effect. One thing led to the other at the end of, uh, you know, a year or two years, three years, I had references and, you know, named the network and I work with them or for them. It's been, it's been a lot of work. It's been, uh, it's not something that you can, I don't know, maybe a lot of people don't like to listen to this because people usually like to hear, oh, here's the secret or here's the magic pill you take. And then, you know, you, you're all of a sudden you've made it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it all starts with you doing something as cheesy as it sounds, do something that you really like and care about. Uh, if what you care about is telling stories, then you're going to learn not only to write those stories, you're not only going to learn how to interview people, you're going to learn how to shoot it. Uh, you know, how you're going to learn to tell a story with only one camera. If you only have one camera, you're going to learn how to tell a story with two cameras, but only one person manage those cameras. And then you're going to learn how to edit that story in the best way possible. And you're going to invest in your gear and in your resources. And then, you know, at the end of the day, because you love it and you're so proficient at it and so passionate about it, people will see that and people will give you the job. And a little, a little um, uh, tip to people interviewing for jobs uh, the best way to go about it is not writing a cover letter, you know, when you're applying for jobs, right. not at all. Something that I've said in interviews that I've had is literally, look, I, I can be, uh, and I have a, you know, a very silly sense of humor, but what <laughs> I tell people when I'm talking to them is, look, I can be a really good interview or a bad interview, but at the end of the day, the quality of my work is what you're looking for, at least in this industry. Right. So look at my work and that, that, that doesn't sh uh, uh, show, that doesn't show arrogance because I don't believe in being arrogant uh, mm -hmm. at all, but I believe in being confident in your work. I'm actually, as a person, I'm very, um, kind of, uh, an introvert, but when it comes to my work is if you look at my work, then that, that will show you why we're talking right now. Right. Then you, uh, em a potential employer, if you look at my work, look at it, really look at it. And then if you're interested, let's talk again. Uh, mm -hmm. If not, you don't have to talk to me ever again. 
but my value is in my work, not in how I can sell myself verbally on, on paper. And that's just because I'm, I'm too long winded as you probably have seen uh, <laughs> no, or heard. Good. And also, uh, I don't, I don't like selling myself on paper and I like my work to speak for myself. And I've been lucky to be able to do so much work that that's how I present myself. Don't talk to me. Don't read me. Look at my work. And then we talk if you're interested in working with me. Yeah. Cause if you're just talking, man, you're just selling wolf tickets, as we said, growing up, you know, and, uh, um, right. you know, if you can't back that up, <laughs> you got a problem. Right. That's a big, big issue you, you left out there, but your work. You know, folks, he has been winning awards since like 2011. National Headliner Award, Telly Award. I am I mean, I'm just going to big you up, man. I know you're not going to do it for yourself. <laughs> so, um, you know, National Emmy nomination, Outstanding Feature in Spanish, New Media Film Festival, winner of the New Media Film Festival, Social Issue Documentaries. <laughs> you know, we didn't see the last of this stuff. Now, I know that uh, you said you were working on a story about farming. Is there any other work that you're working on now um, outside of that particular story? Or is there um, something coming down the pike we need to know about? It's so interesting. Uh, what I can talk about is my personal work. I can't tell you about the work that I'm doing with NBC. But oh, yeah, the personal, personal work, is what I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been in the... Uh, uh, I've been working for four and a half years uh, as a side project. It's a very important project to me. It's uh, a docu feature documentary, my first one, in association with the NBA. Um, it's a story about uh, how fleeting a career in the NBA can be. Most people don't know that an average career in the NBA is only 4.5 years long. Right. Uh, most people most people don't know that since 2010, more than 800 pro athletes have had to leave the NBA due to career ending injuries. Most people don't know that basketball is much more of a higher impact sport nowadays than even football. It sounds crazy, but, uh, or injury prone uh, uh, um, sport. So I've been working on this documentary for four and a half years following the life of a former NBA player. His name is Gravis Vasquez. Right. Uh, he was like, uh, he was uh, one of the best, you know, pilots in the, in the league. Um, or assisted, you know, assisting uh, pilots in the league, but uh, he uh, suffered an injury and had to leave the Brooklyn Nets in 2016. Mm -hmm. And he left saying, I'm going to be back. Uh, so from 2016 till today, we've been filming with him as he's gone through every single, you know, version of, uh, of his, you know, grief, you know, it's like anger, uh, denial, you know, and finally acceptance and moving on forth. Uh, we've been able to interview Kevin Durant mm -hmm. for the, documentary uh manu ginobili if you're into ba basketball you know yeah. who those people are so um so that is my my passion project It's one that's made me sweat uh cry bleed uh extremely difficult to put a, a project together uh and, and on an independent level like this so so difficult uh, but it's one that continues. And I'm also, uh, if everything goes as planned, going to be releasing a book I've been working on since 2009. Wonderful. And it's, uh, and it's a photo book on the streets of Venezuela in Caracas. I partner up with uh, a self-taught poet who spent eight years in prison. Um, and she wrote the poetry for it. And I took the, the, the photos uh, for the book uh, in the span of five years. Uh, and we've been putting it together. Uh, we've been working hard on it for the past three years, and hopefully it'll come out in 2022. But um, so that that will be out there as well. These are side projects. I do believe that if you have a of a job that takes up most of your time or mental, you know, mental capacities, then for your mental health, having a side project to put your energy into and get some sort of other kind of reward. It's very important. So I'm lucky to have two projects that have been ongoing for years and I'm hoping that I'll see them through. Well, I'm going to have you make a commitment right now. If you could, when those okay. projects come out, you got to come back and talk about them. Sure thing. You got to let me know, man. Cause uh, that basketball documentary, you know, is something that I think that kids can benefit from watching. I always tell kids have a plan B. Everybody don't make the mm. NBA. Or if you do, mm -hmm. you're fortunate enough to do it. You know, these situations come up, whereas you mm -hmm. might get injured. And if basketball mm -hmm. is all you know, you know mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to have a problem. 
you might get in the yeah, NBA yeah. and might not actually be a star player. You can be a bench warmer, man. And at the end of the day, a bench warmer's check is not Kevin Durant's check. So you may not be able to sustain yourself for but so many years. And yeah, I think that's something that, you know, don't get me started on that. I used to coach basketball. <laughs> so, you know, um, we definitely got to have you back to talk about that because I think that's very important. Also with your other work as well. Um, very artistic work. And I definitely want to check it out now. Um, one more thing, or at least one or two more things before I let you go, you gave me so much time and I really appreciate it, Carlos. Uh, do people get you confused with Carlos Beltran, the, uh, baseball player? <laughs> do you get that? <laughs> He's been my uh, icebreaker for the past 10 years or 11 years. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, it's, it's always a fun thing, uh, you know, to talk about. You always use that. My usual line is, no, I wish I had too much money or yes, but I changed careers or, you know, that <laughs> kind of stuff. But uh, it always breaks the ice in a good way. You know, you can't uh, can't go wrong with the popular name, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, he had his fair share of issues as well <laughs> so i think you're doing a little bit better all right mm -hmm. and one more thing i ask a lot of people this question um in the hopes to make them think um what would the carlos today with all the accomplishments and all the things all the projects say to young carlos from venezuela mm -hmm. what would you what would you tell yourself if you're able to do that yeah it's um it's a funny thing. Um, you know what? I would tell them everything happens for a reason. That's that's exactly what I would tell that person. I wouldn't tell them to work harder. I wouldn't tell them to be happier. I wouldn't tell them to be more secure because all that could affect the way that you do things if we're really taking this hypothetical into reality. But I would understand that everything happens for a reason because at the end of the day, what my, my life has taught me is that with every decision, there's a consequence, there's a consequence, there's a consequence, a butterfly effect. And I am where I am because of all the mistakes and all victories I've had since I decided to go into this uh, career. So, yeah. All right. So we thank you, Carlos. And I'm going to let you go, folks. This is Carlos P. Beltran. I encourage you, please check out his work. Carlos, can you tell us where we can find you on all your latest adventures, buddy? Just at carlospbeltran.com or, or at carlospbeltran. That's my uh, every social network. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And you can catch the Only One Mike podcast on Instagram and Twitter at the Only One Mike P1 and Facebook at the Only One Mike podcast. Also, you can contact us via email at the Only One Mike Zero Zero at gmail.com. There you can post your comments, questions. Anything that's on your mind, you can go ahead and leave it. Don't forget to like and subscribe when you do. Carlos, once again, thank you, my man. Thank you. I really appreciate you for coming on. Very insightful. And guys, make sure you look out for his work, please. And as always, I tell you to speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even the dull and the ignorant, because they, too, have their story to tell. Thanks again, Carlos. Thank you. All right. Take it easy, man. And the One Mike Podcast is signing off. Peace.